In the mid-1970s, Western democracy was groaning under the weight of an economic crisis. The US was in financial trouble. The UK was experiencing double-digit inflation. And Australia was in the grip of a crippling recession. Out of this chaos, a moment of global synchronicity took place. Punk music was born. Almost simultaneously and independently of each other, the Ramones were thrashing away in New York, the Sex Pistols were enraging the establishment in London, and in of all places, Brisbane, one band was rewriting the music rulebook. Saints like punk rock before punk rock. Plug into your amp, turn it up, and the way you go. Johnny Ramone said, have you ever heard the Saints from Australia? They're just like us. The Saints were a proper rock band. Turbo engines full on. Here we are. Here's our calling card. I just thought, wow, that's pretty wild. There's a band that sounds like that that's come out of Brisbane. <laughs> Governed by an ultra-conservative premier, backed by a corrupt police force, and with a population that had no desire for change, Queensland was the perfect breeding ground for a musical and cultural revolution. If you lived in Utopia, what would be the points of kicking against the pricks? This is the story of Brisbane, and a group of four suburban boys who would unwittingly play a part in changing the world's musical landscape forever. The Saints. The evolution, the revolution, and the repercussions. The whole music business needed to kick up the arse and it got it. This is Brisbane, the capital of Queensland in the mid-70s. A crucible of blandness. Brisbane was asleep. The whole city was asleep. Well, Brisbane was a pretty sort of desperate place. There wasn't a lot happening. It was like kick the tumbleweed down, you know, Adelaide Street on Saturday afternoon. You could only go to one place in Brisbane to get a hamburger after six o'clock up at the windmill on Petrie Terrace. These people are Queenslanders. They're supposed to be somehow different from other Australians. Conservative, authoritarian, intolerant of other points of view. Can I, uh, you know what I really hate most? What do you hate most? Books. What do you think about women? When you need them, you need them. Queensland was considered to be the deep north. It was like I grew up in a 1950s American B-grade black and white movie. You know, everyone met a girl, got married, had a family, went to work, went home. And here's father now, coming home from his daily work. It's just like incredibly suburban. And the politics of Queensland at the time was dominated by one man. Joe B. Yorke Peterson, deeply religious, deeply conservative, a man who used incoherence as a weapon. The whole situation in relation to the, these, this question. What do you have You haven't answered the here. question. Have you got this a... is quite beside the point. Well, I'm telling you what the point is. I'm telling you what the issue is. A non-drinking, non-smoking peanut farmer from Kingaroy. A former police minister who believed in family values, enforced by the power of law and order backed by a police force he'd nurtured with a firm grip before ascending to the throne. I'm the law around here. <laughs> there was a fairly heavy police presence that would break up meetings of people, so it wasn't really a very nice place. And we are a responsible government, and we intend to maintain law and order. In 1971, Joe set the tone for the rest of the decade when the South African rugby team, the Springboks, toured Australia. A potent symbol of apartheid, they were met with protests around the country, but nowhere were they as aggressively policed as in Brisbane. Joe decided to set an example to the rest of Australia and declared a state of emergency. Then he released the reins and 500 of the state's finest clashed violently with protesters. There was just 
hundreds of them, and they were literally peeling the men off and bashing them. And we were just running for our lives, we felt. It was terrifying. It divided Brisbane into two groups, and that is conservative groups and the counterculture. And in the mid-70s, if you wanted change, music gave you one of the loudest voices. Just a few kilometres from the heart of those protests was Corinda State High School, where two sons of immigrants, Ed Cooper and Chris Bailey, started to share a common passion. So to me, Australia was a great, big, open, fabulous playground. Some kids like motorbikes, some kids like surfing. We just kind of fell into becoming music fans. I always had an interest in music, and I started playing guitar when I was reasonably young. I didn't ever want to do anything else. I suppose living in the outer suburbs and being immigrants, there was that feeling of being just a little bit different, like aliens. Joining Ed and Chris, drummer Ivor Hay came along for the ride. The world's a big place. Brisbane wasn't particularly big at that time. We used to go to the airports just to drink and look at planes leaving to think, well, one day we'll leave Brisbane and we'll actually do something. These three school friends would form the nucleus of what would become the Saints. All they needed was a bass player. They were playing at the uh, Queensland Academy of Music and they were just amazing. They said, well, look, you know, they're looking for a new bass player. And I was uh, invited to join the band and that's what happened, really. And the Saints' first incarnation was born. But their musical roots were influenced by a major social and political event. In the late 1960s, the Vietnam War had divided the Western world. And for the first time, music had been at the forefront of the charge for change. It was that screaming underground soundtrack that would influence the next generation of Australian musical pioneers, like the Saints. We'd sort of had a pretty wide exposure, I guess, to a lot of Australian, British and, and American music. Things like the New York Dolls, Stooges and uh, MC5. Kick off the jails, motherfucker! Yeah, we'd heard about bands like MC5 and Iggy and the Stooges. Yes, there was something about the, the whole sound of that sort of stripped it back before things had become more arranged, more sophisticated. But in some ways it didn't really matter what other people were doing. The Saints kind of rewrote the rule book. I never felt any sort of desire to copy the, the people that inspired me. I just take that inspiration and sort of develop something else. So we were completely out of step with what was considered to be what people should be doing musically. But the popular music of the mid-70s was everything that rock and roll wasn't. And now uh, we're going to hear from the Wickedy Whack Band playing Can't Get By Without You. Coming up to the mid-70s, if you were a kid, what had rock and roll got to offer you? Absolutely nothing. When I leave your door, when we Our age group weren't getting records made for us. Girl, it just ain't right. No, music was almost empty. Absolute crap, like Olivia Newton John and the Eagles and the Bee Gees. The Queensland music scene at the time was really, really boring. I don't know if there were any original bands, and if they were, they didn't strike me as uh, being all that good anyway. Brisbane's suburban wasteland was dotted with community halls used for prayer meetings, neighbourhood gatherings and any other event that served tea and cake. With no pubs or clubs supporting original music, the Saints started using these halls to put on shows. 
Soon, the quiet clink of China teacups was giving way to growling guitars and sweaty teens. There were attendant problems with that because of all the fights and assaults. And... An entire city in the throes of panic. The police did raid and punches were thrown and I ended up in the watch house for the night. That was the kind of thing that went on pretty regularly in Brisbane at the time. But it wasn't long before the Saints created their own venue in the house where they rehearsed, Club 76. Club 76 was basically a, a house. So we started using it as a, a rehearsal room because it seemed the easy thing to do was to bring people to us. This is where we used to perform. When you look at it now, it's four metres wide, hardly enough room to have a drum kit. And we'd fill this up with people on a Friday night and, and just make as much noise as possible. Uh, Ed's style of playing, Chris's vocals, was fairly unique because it was pretty loud and noisy. We could clear a room pretty quickly. Um, uh. I think we quickly developed a reputation as being the worst band that had ever existed. And, and then other people thought we were the best thing that had ever come along, sort of thing. So it was fairly polarising. I think people like to think that the sort of primitive beast of early rock and roll had kind of been put into some sort of a cage and I think the Saints kind of not only demolished that, I think they wanted more. The stars are spaced at random in the sky, therefore the coordinates of a star map expressed numerically would be a random series of numbers. In science, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Social disharmony is no different. In the mid-1970s, New York was running out of money. A city of decay and slums, New York will now go bankrupt. And I find no uh, substantial sentiment to bail out New York City. London had run out of jobs. The danger of unemployment at the beginning of the year, I said, was at least as great as inflation. And Joe Bielke Peterson's Brisbane was a pressure cooker of conservatism. No government or community can allow tyranny by a minority. Boredom, frustration and anger delivered a bastard child and punk exploded into life. By the mid-70s, there seemed to be this spontaneous uh, outcrop of bands in most of the English-speaking world. You had the Ramones in New York, you had the Pistols in London, and in Australia you had the Saints. The first thing that has to be said about this synchronicity was that it was pre-internet. How did any of us make any connections to anybody else? If you look at it on a global way, it was all hitting the same receptor somewhere, you know. It was maybe just people's primal reaction to what was actually going on around them. In all corners of the world, people were going, we're going to tear down what's going on and build something new up. But it was the attitude combined with the music that was so electrifying, and because it articulated its moment. And that moment was defined in September 1976 when the Saints released the world's first independent punk 45, I'm Stranded. I got a loan from a credit union or something which funded the single and um, we went to a, a, a studio in Tuong and recorded it in, in, a, in a day, I think. How do you actually get your music out to somebody when there is no way of doing it? There's no radio, there's no TV exposure. You're on your own with just a little bit of vinyl. In the DIY world of punk music, you take the shotgun approach. The Saints mailed their sound to the world. How many did you make? How many did you prep? 500. 
people. And how many did you send away? Four hundred. Despite being almost anonymous in Australia, people overseas were devouring the sound of the saints. In the English Music Bible Sounds, John Ingham named their song the single of this week and every week, saying it's so bloody incredible. And the rest of Britain started taking notice when influential BBC broadcaster John Peel started playing the track. The clash of driving back from a gig and they stopped the car because they couldn't work out where this music was coming from because it wasn't coming from the UK, it was coming from Australia. The EMI suits in London heard it and screamed down the phone to their Australian branch who signed the band immediately. And in early 1977, I'm Stranded was commercially released. I'm Stranded turned up. We were just totally blown away. Noisy, it's brash, it's heartfelt and got something to say really. Chris Bailey's sharp lyrics about suburban isolation, written on a train at midnight, were resonating with people all over the world. You're stranded on your own is a universal statement. Yeah. I think everybody in the universe at the time was starting to think that way. The Saints did I'm Stranded, you know, I mean, what more do you have to say, you know? first line of the Boomtown Rats first single was The World Owes Me a Living Boomtown Rats uh, here, bit of social comment for you, have a listen to the lyrics on this The words with the saints were brilliant and there was really a similarity of intent um, in the, that first group of the bands Probably coming from a very similar place to the Saints musically, our equivalent of I'm Stranded would have been Don't Dictate. You needed a lot of anger and a lot of energy to get out of your immediate environment. And then, you know, the dam burst, and out came bands from all over the world sort of joined in this thing, and it worked. Punk music erupted across the globe. In London, with bands like Buzzcocks, The Damned, The Stranglers and The Clash, suddenly the sweaty rebellion was becoming a form of legitimate creative expression. And in New York, punk was regarded as something approaching high art, with Patti Smith and bands like Talking Heads and Television. But guys at the front row, definitely the Saints were there. When the Sex Pistols and Buzzcocks Clash started putting our records out, you think, hold on a minute, that Saints one was around a little bit before all this, you know. Back in Australia, the pioneering music of the Saints was finally getting airplay, with community stations like 4 Z in their hometown of Brisbane. But commercial radio wouldn't have a bar of it. There are Sex Pistols, Stranglers, Boomtown Rats, Backstabbers, Electric Chair, Extermination. Yeah, yeah. Rings in their noses and rings in their ears with a chain combining together. To me, this doesn't, uh, doesn't gel. Yeah, I don't think Australia's ready for the punk rock image. Despite the lack of mainstream attention, punk was energising musicians across Australia. The only thing that really united all the bands was that we all knew that we were working outside the mainstream. Before, music was something that came from overseas, made by real musicians, and suddenly with people realising, no, that's not true. I can kind of play, and my mate can kind of play, and we know a guy that can be a drummer, so let's just be a band, have some fun. It was about the potential of what you could do, and throw the rule book out the window. The Saints had a huge influence in that way. I stood and watched the Saints on stage and, and just felt my mind change about things and knew that I would never be the same again. It was important to me when we were in Brisbane that the band had its own identity and its own sound. Turbo engines full on. Here we are, here's our calling card. The Saints 
were so far ahead of the curve in music generally. And they obviously were jetted straight to the UK. What a fucking waste of time! It wasn't just getting out of Brisbane, it was getting out of Australia. In mid-1977, the Saints packed their bags. Up to mighty London came an Irish lad one day. By the time they reached London, the movement they'd been instrumental in ushering in was not only alive and well, but leaking into the mainstream. Spearheaded by perhaps the most infamous punk band of all. The cult is called punk, the music punk rock, basic rock music, raw, outrageous and crude, like their fan magazine, Sniffing Glue. And fanzines like Sniffing Glue knew the Saints were coming and welcomed their arrival. Once the, the Sex Pistols and the London thing happened and it got a kind of profile, then everyone around the world could look to that and sort of say, you know, we already understand this. The fact that the Saints had already reached that point in Brisbane independently is kind of amazing. It actually is astonishing to be these four hillbillies who get like you know, bus tickets to go to you know, the West End. We were there a couple of days and then we did the shows at the Roundhouse with uh, the Talking Heads and then the Ramones. I was there. And that was fantastic. It quite a bit. There was a lot of expectations, and when we logged there, things always went wrong. So Ed broke a string, I broke a drum pedal or something like that. I blew up two or three amps over the two nights. Um, not intentional. That gig at the Roundhouse was perhaps the epitome of punk. Raw, powerful and threatening. Well, obviously, punk rock's nothing if not energetic, but do you really think that punk rockers are such a threat to society that you're justified in banning their concerts in London? I will do everything I can to prevent certain groups, whom I do not propose to name on this programme, from ever appearing in London again. What's wrong with that? I'm, I represent the licensing authority. Instructions are to prepare for an attack by an unknown enemy. <laughs> Despite the Saints having left Brisbane, punk had not. New bands were springing up and they would face increasing hostility. And out of that came The Leftovers, which was sort of, to me, the next cab off the rank out of Brisbane. Bands like The Saints gave us an idea that this thing was bigger than just us. The Leftovers were just wild. They were almost violent on stage, I'd say. You'd go and see them and something would always happen. Pubs wouldn't take us and see, see the way we were dressed and they just wouldn't have a bar of us. Bands like The Leftovers didn't sit well with Joe's vision of a conservative utopia. But in the late 70s, he had a willing and powerful instrument to deal with. It. He upped the ante, pushing his police commissioner out for being too soft on dissent. What kind of a job is this anyway? Garbage, that's all we handle. And appointed a willing ally. Terry Lewis to the top job. Brisbane had a police minister, the minister for everything, and he was just a monster, a corrupt monster. He saw us as some sort of threat because we were all outsiders, we were all different. We just needed something to scream at. I was very surprised that Brisbane's weekend press didn't report that 21 people were arrested at a dance in West End on Friday night. Within about two hours of the big starting, police had turned up. There were hundreds of people dragged out, about 30 or something were arrested. Those sort of things just happened quite a bit in Brisbane, unfortunately. We were so sick of the cops busting up every gig in Brisbane. I mean, we just wanted to see an end to it. We didn't want to leave Brisbane because I mean, we, we felt we had something to do here, you know, it was to change people's attitudes. But bands like the Saints, all the best to them. You know, I was glad they got away when they did. The Saints had become hot property in London. 
From not being able to book a gig in Brisbane and playing do-it-yourself shows in community halls, they were now headlining at the famous marquee, where The Who and Hendrix made their names. On came the Saints, and it was just pandemonium. It was the middle of summer, of course, in England. I'm not sure there was any air conditioning in there. The people running the club would even turn the heating on to make it hotter. I remember Chris coming off stage and being sick. Ivor, the drummer, even stood up and collapsed against the back wall. It was just absolutely vile in a lot of ways. But it was uh, iconic, it was the marquee. You go in there and you see all the graffiti from bands going back to Jimi Hendrix and the Stones, and all of that was there. We added to it. The marquee shows cemented the Saints as one of punk's most seminal bands. Saints banged it out. They were so powerful, yet they were so simple. It just fueled the fire that I already had that I wanted to do this too. It was, hey, wait a minute, God, anybody could do this. I could do this. I should do this. And he did. Jello Biafra was inspired to form one of punk's most political bands, Dead Kennedys. Maybe there is something to live for besides a teenage depression that was getting me down so bad and all. It just kind of fueled that Cinderella, Walter Mitty ambition to, you know, want to be in one of these kind of bands. And around the world, increasingly, punk was becoming a voice for political and social change. The punk thing was reflecting what was going on. It was actually being realistic. You know, it was very driven by an articulate attitude, a, a political attitude. Uh, quite a lot of people were uh, politically aware, which is, is always a good thing for musicians or any other artistic group, you know? Well, punks were dissent. The dissent was growing. It was a movement that all young people started wanting to be part of. Young people having the chance to voice their opinion on something with a lot of anger. Our job is to say it's crap and it must change. Take a look where you live got the army on the street. Stiff Little Fingers were singing about the horrors of life in war-torn Northern Ireland. And The Clash were writing about London's simmering racial tensions. And while there were no bombs being thrown in Joe Bjorky Peterson's Brisbane, the quiet, repressed capital of Queensland was fast becoming a political powder keg. Queensland government is not impressed by clenched fists or raised voices. In late 77, Joe cracked down on any form of public gathering. Three or more people walking down the street together could be declared illegal. You couldn't actually have a march without getting a permit, and the people who granted the permit were the police themselves. Sunshine State to us was the SS State. You know, you get busloads of police arriving, like, you just look at them and go, oh, it's like an army. You would see across the street a bunch of guys in suits. They looked like homicide, but they were special branch. They would look at you with, we want to kill you, in their eyes. After serious clashes between right-to-march protesters and police, the Brisbane Church Synods united and called for a repeal of the law. The Premier slapped them down, accusing them of siding with communists. It was a thuggish way to police things. It was a way in which the police cemented their separateness from society. In Brisbane, you just have to wear a black T-shirt and a pair of black jeans and the cops would be on to you. Queensland was a very small place in those days and well cut off from anywhere and very suspicious of anything that came from down south states. So when Joe and the police play the fear card, it works well. He wanted to rule Queensland his way and with an iron fist. 
when you have politicians who are prepared to align themselves with active serving police officers, you have a lethal combination. Students and gays and blacks and protesters, they didn't have any part in his vision of Queensland. And the counterculture got stronger and stronger the more that the government became oppressive. No one, it seemed, was safe. And the music counterculture, discouraged from playing inner city venues, continued to perform in the places where the Saints started it all, community halls. The hall gigs were fantastic in that suddenly there was live music on and you'd go, the Hamilton Hall? Where is that? You'd have to find the place. But I don't think it took very long before the Queensland police were also visiting almost every one of those venues. We came here one night, it was a benefit for a close friend of ours who was in a band called The Sharks. And when the event finally finished, it was so hot that everyone rushed out onto the street, into the cool. And as soon as we got out there, seven police cars came roaring around. Police just stormed in and started just dragging people away. The more people that screamed, the more the police would take people outside and then more people would run outside and out, out on the street there were a line of cops arresting people. They used to have these little truncheon things about this long and they were quick with them. One of the guys in my band muttered under his breath, pigs. And I started, you know, bashing him. One chap was being carted off for no particular reason at all. They rammed his head into the side of the wagon and then he was charged with damaging police property. If they could get you out of here and into that police headquarters, anything could happen. The little trip they used to do is this little thing with the handcuffs and smack you like that with the handcuffs. There was no sense to it. No sense. There's nothing you can do to stop us. Leave us alone. Going to a gig in Melbourne or in Sydney was not a life-threatening experience, uh, whereas going to a gig in Brisbane, you could end up in jail, you could end up in bashed by the police. This police brutality was immortalised in the song Task Force by Brisbane punk band Razor. That's where I drew my inspiration from at 17 to write Task Force. It was what I had experienced one-on-one -on -one with the police, arresting and accosting and abusing, and just unbelievable. Task Force was a group of Queensland Police Force who would turn up at these gigs. Their way of trying to blend in was by wearing Hawaiian shirts. And of course, this was like bizarre in the extreme because as soon as someone walked in with a Hawaiian shirt, you go, uh-oh, Task Force is here. And people would kind of scatter. It was a political bent to our music, but that was unavoidable because of what was going on at the time. Razor had lyrics that actually related to Queensland, that actually related to their lives. In Brisbane, the social political climate was perfect for the, for the troops, as it were. It was damn scary. The Queensland police had this number plate register. Razor, you know, they were constantly getting pulled over and you know, unload all your gear out of the car, we're searching the car. Queensland's police force is not corrupt, it is not brutal, and it is one of the best in Australia. For goodness sakes, where else in the world, on your way to a dance, would you get arrested, thrown in a jail cell all night, be fingerprinted, filmed, interrogated, and telephone booked to hide the bruises? When it happens every day, you really are starting to be given the message Get out of town. Despite being essentially outlawed in Brisbane, in the rest of the world, punk music was achieving mainstream success. And so were the Saints. In July 77, their next single, This Perfect Day, charted in the UK Top 40. And you've had quite a bit of success on the, um, on the charts, I believe. Well, 32. Yeah. Which ain't too bad for country boys. Right. Covering just outside the charts is a band from Australia, currently in this country, The Saints, and this is called This Perfect Day. After a drive around the car, on the 
They performed the song on Top of the Pops, Britain's highest rating music program, almost guaranteeing the Saints a huge bump in sales. But the title, This Perfect Day, would turn out to be a bit optimistic. EMI didn't anticipate the demand for the single and only produced a limited run. Unavailable to buy, the record crashed out of the charts. But it didn't stop the band from exploring their music further. Their 1978 album, Eternally Yours, was bold, brassy and featured a track that was a scathing comment on consumerism, a song that many believe defined the punk ethos. Hello, here's the countdown with Chris Bailey of the Saints and here is our new single called Know Your Prada. Necessary to kind of develop it and retain whatever you know uniqueness that we had. I mean, when you come to your second album, it's difficult because you're not that new thing anymore, and there's new people coming up behind you all the time. Because I thought it was a great album, and they were trying to dig deep with the lyrics and and explore other kinds of music and not just put out the same thing over and over and over again. You have to move fast. You have to step ahead, you have to be ahead, because you, once you're behind, you're dead. A revolutionary idea is in the making. Students of the new instrument create weird and unique music. The Saints were evolving, and so in turn was the scene in Brisbane. Like the Saints before them, new bands continue to push the boundaries of what music could be. By 1978 here, people were making music that wasn't all just about banging up three chords and being as fast and loud as possible. I suppose it's a musical genre, punk's limited. So, of course, the music was going to change. The aesthetic changed very quickly, became much more artful. Bands like Zero began experimenting with new instruments to create new sounds. We just did crazy things. We recorded sound and image with noise and music, and we were chaotic. And to us, that just presented the madness of that time. There wasn't anybody else around who was doing stuff like that, so we would have certainly been pushed out onto some edge there. If you, you weren't a musician, it didn't matter. The whole idea was to express the sound and the feeling and the words that you wanted to express. Increasingly, the Brisbane music scene was being infused with an art sensibility. If arty means pretentious, then maybe so. Maybe that's what we were. It was just something to do to shine a bright light into our own little corner of the universe. The Riptides were pursuing new directions in pop while embracing the Saints' DIY mentality. Really, what we did straight away was to go and start to learn to play music rather than to watch music, if you will. One of the first gigs, uh, uh, Mark Callahan turned up and he was wearing a dinner suit and he was playing the violin, you know, so they were a little bit all over the place, but it didn't seem like very long before they started actually writing their own material and coming up with songs like 77 Sunset Strip. You know, we were pretty much in awe of uh, some of these songs because they really had uh, a great sound and a great Brisbane sound. But, you know, we were aliens for another planet playing this you know, pop punk music. It was sort of experimental, you know. There was a bit of this avant-gardism started to come into it and I don't think anybody could deny. The go-between set the, set the tone. You know. Songwriters Robert Foster and Grant McClellan would go on to write some of our country's most enduring songs about place. 
The go-betweens would define what became known as the Brisbane striped sunlight sound. I love their songs. They were intellectual songs. They were inter- intellectual young men. Basically, they were looking for a woman drummer and there was only two in town. The other one didn't want the gig I did. I mean, a lot of people didn't want to join that band. They just didn't understand them. They just sounded different. Their music was very based in more of a pop idea, but they clearly had a very idiosyncratic sound and a very individualistic approach to what they were doing, which always makes me interested. The go-betweens were completely unorthodox in sort of that punk stereotype. But that was the whole thing about Brisbane, is that you could have bands like the Riptides, Razor and the go-betweens, and everyone was very much of one mind, and that is... We're in this together and the enemy is Bjorki Peterson. (laughs) At its epicentre, London, punk was becoming increasingly bourgeois and as it became more popular, what had begun as a subversive musical subculture was now at risk of becoming a cliché. The party really lasted six months to a year, that initial explosion. Everyone thought that you could do whatever you wanted, you know. It was a, a real moment of freedom. And then, of course, he got straight-jacketed again and it became a new kind of fundamentalism. Months later, suddenly there was thousands of punk bands starting every week. I think there was a lot of competition in 1978 and I think it might have been more difficult for a band like The Saints to get themselves across. The audience and the press said we didn't look punk enough. Do you think, well, geez, we're not a punk band, we were a Brisbane rock and roll band. And the Saints' acidic response to the scene was the song, Private Affair. We didn't really fit in to that scene. We were sort of outsiders. They looked like slobs, though punk had become a bit of a fashion movement by then. The fashion aspects were fairly superficial. The Clash had all their clothes designed for them. The Pistols was all Vivian Westwood. And the Saints were just like, mm, fuck off. Everyone in the band didn't really want to be part of it. But punk, as a movement, was beginning to crumble from the inside. The scene at the time started off quite friendly and it became very, what I'd call gunslinger syndrome. People would challenge us every night and they would come just to smash up a gig. The Stranglers experienced this on their first tour of Australia. Their Brisbane concerts were a sellout, but would end in controversy. Gene saw people spitting. I probably was. I have no idea. This guy comes up on the station, I just kick the shit out of him. He clocked me straight across the scone with his bass and smashed my head right in. And then this almighty kakong, you know, through the PA. It turned out, I think, that some of the people in the audience were um, special police or something, and they were set up just to break up the gig. We didn't know anything about the politics of Australia at that time, and we were amazed to find what we found there. It was this strange not very free society, we thought. The authorities didn't seem to like us and seemed to be monitoring everything we did. We've done about five TV interviews since we got into Australia. None of them come out. None of them have appeared. Some sinister campaign going on to keep us off television. We had to do get get the hell out of there. So it gave us an awful lot of fuel for um, a subsequent song which we called Nuclear Device and uh, about the Wizard of Oz, this guy. Well, Joe BLP Peterson, he sold off Aboriginal lands for uranium. discovered this cyclical situation in Queensland, which was completely different from the rest of, of our experience in Australia. There's no incentive in life when you're controlled and where you're dominated and where you're intimidated. You ought to move around the world and then you will appreciate just what it means to be in Queensland. The Stranglers' Wizard of Oz seemed untouchable. Joe confronted demonstrations demanding the right to march. But when he came down hard on protesters, 
his government and its increasingly thuggish police force attracted global attention. In London, Ed Cooper was tracking Joe's policing policies on the BBC News and wrote the song Brisbane Security City. So Brisbane Security City was sort of a, a bit of a response to that. It wasn't meant to be a sort of a fist in the air kind of call to arms or anything. It was more of a reflection, recollection, you know, something I wanted to capture in that atmosphere of unease or menace. Brisbane Security City was included on the Saints' third and final album. Released at the end of 1978, prehistoric sounds pushed their music even further, infusing rock with jazz and blues influences. The Saints made the worst career move, which was they wanted to keep moving forward with their music. You didn't hear so much about them in the press after that. You know. It is actually surprising that we managed to still get uh, record company support to do that album, especially given where I wanted to go with it. But at this stage, Chris and I had started to fall apart artistically. I think his contribution is actually really strong, but he, his heart wasn't in it. Although now regarded as something of a classic, at the time, prehistoric sounds was a commercial failure. And simmering artistic and personal conflicts between Bailey and Cooper saw the band quietly break up. I like the dynamics of a rock band, but the practicalities of a rock band are really friggin' tedious. There was, for the first time, I guess, the tension as to who will be boss. The implosion started to happen as soon as the band became successful. Things changed overnight. I decided that the era of, like, it's all the four lads in the bus together making their way to the top, that's, that was a bygone era. They were told us well, they're not going to work together anymore. That's it, that's showbiz. <laughs> what if we go and do something else? The evolution of the Saints is incredible. But I saw this band make three records that they went and covered this universe. Oh, I always really respected them for that because they knew no two albums were going to sound alike. That's probably why the band broke up. You know, they, it achieved what it had needed to achieve. The Saints are always going to be this, you know, shooting star. You know, this meteor that actually crashed, you know, and blew it all up. They're a thin blue line, and if you have lawlessness, you get the law of the jungle. Music may have lost a seminal band, but the Sunshine State hadn't lost its guiding light. In the early 1980s, Dead Kennedys played Brisbane's Festival Hall, and they got to experience Joe's particular brand of democracy firsthand. Afterwards, um, some of us were drinking some beers outside the back door. Last call for alcohol. Last call for free speech. A Brisbane cop car pulled up and arrested D.H. Poligro, who's African-American, for drinking beer on the sidewalk while black. And East Bay Ray then asked a cop, hey, what are you doing this for? And they arrested him. And off to jail they went for the night. Drink up your happy hours now enforced by law. Somebody gave Ray a, uh, a shirt with a shape of Queensland with police state written on it. And I even met one guy who told me he had been arrested by the police as he was walking down the street for carrying a concealed weapon in a bag of groceries. A pineapple. That just blew my mind. So I can just imagine what it was like to live under somebody who basically came across to me as a small-time Banana Republic dictator. A monster of such size and power and horrifying hatred of man. 
In 1986, after an 18-year reign, Joe faced the polls once more. Some say he causes trouble, but he only wants what's best. Miraculously, he was re-elected. Some say that he's a stirrer. He says we're better than the rest. Unfortunately for Joe, journalists began sniffing around, investigating police and political corruption. Yet we all know he's made Queensland what it is today. This resulted in the Fitzgerald Inquiry, a probe into the Queensland police misuse of power. He loves it like a father. His love will never stop, because this man, this team, this party put Queensland there on top. Joe's mate and police commissioner, Terry Lewis, went to jail for 14 years. And despite nothing sticking to Joe, the damage was done. He resigned. I wish you well. Thank you all. Goodbye. sort of like the shackles had just been really cast off. It's a, a mood of possibility. See for the first time thrilling pictures of the world of tomorrow. As in science, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Joe was gone, but he'd unintentionally been instrumental in the birth of a rich and vibrant subculture that would, upon his resignation, go on to transform Brisbane. It produced bands like the Go-Betweens, Powderfinger and Regurgitator. Bands that just wanted to make music, like the Saints. And that legacy continues. Violent Soho, an internationally acclaimed young band from Brisbane's outer suburbs, paid homage to the city's turbulent musical past by covering Razor's song Task Force for their US debut single. The relevance with a band like Violent Soho to us is quite sincere. They said we've come from the suburbs just like you did. We were just a young school band of friends. Oh, it's just the best compliment in the world, I guess. that on a seven inch for our first sort of statement in the in the US is exactly where we're from and also paying respect to what had come before us. Shows were being raided, you know, you could be arrested for walking with more than three people through Brisbane cities. It made us feel like empowered that this is what our city went through. Because the only reason we existed was because of all the work that all these other bands did in. The main influence that uh, the Saints would have had on us is hearing that possibly the first ever punk band was from our city. Feeling that it's okay to be who we are, you know, feeling that it's okay to be from Brisbane, that's because of the legacy that they left. The Saints were a group of suburban kids who only ever wanted to play music, but unwittingly became musical pioneers. Most musical revolutions do happen in really the unexpected places. I'm hoping that, you know, whatever we did, did actually break something in terms of allowing people to, to move forward in some way. Without question, the Saints were in the pack. You know, were they punk? I don't know. What was that, you know? It was an attitudinal thing. The Saints were at the forefront of a movement that not only changed Brisbane, but the entire world. Punk rock wasn't just entertainment. It was questioning who you are philosophically, questioning everything around, you know? Questioning your surroundings and the government. It was an incredibly oppressive time. You have to react to that, and they can't stop you singing. Saints released that record simultaneously to other things going on all over the world, totally unrelated, which means that nobody owns it. It was something that happened. But in the midst of all this poverty or hardship and difficulty and strikes and everything else, this um, fireball came in of punk rock, you know. I, I want you. 
Next week at 9.30, the romance between an Australian musician, a poor village girl and the resulting musical explosion, the Cambodian Space Project. And next on ABC, Lateline. I'm alone.